Great. We're ready. So after that amazing uh, talk this morning by Tom Graham, we're in some ways continuing this theme, a panel discussion now. Uh, uh, and we'll begin with about a half hour talk by Anatol Levin on the Wolfowitz Doctrine and the Tragedy of U.S.-Russian Relations, and then comments by Tom Graham and Hannah Norte. Anatol. Thank you so much. And it's a, it's a great pleasure to, to follow such brilliant remarks by Tom and by Hannah, uh, expositions of the situation. Uh, my remarks will be largely about blobs from a former aspirant bloblet or blobling. Do you all know the, the, the new use of the term blob uh, as coined by Ben Rhodes? A brilliant formulation. Anyone who doesn't know, you know about blobs, no? Ah, well, uh, Rhodes, who was a, uh, an advisor to, um, a foreign policy advisor to the, the, the Clinton administration, uh, coined the term blob. Uh, it comes from a, a science fiction film, and more particularly the poster of a science fiction film from the early 1960s, in which this, this clump of extraterrestrial matter uh, invades the earth and ingests people. And the poster has this human arm trying to emerge from the blob and being sucked back in again. And Rhodes brilliantly uh, used this image to describe the US foreign and security establishment and uh, the way in which it uh, ingests possibly dissident or opposed or uh, different voices and turns them, you know, it turns them into itself, digests them, uh, and transforms them. And uh, this was very much how he saw, in many ways, Obama himself, as a man with uh, basically realist and um, speaking for the, the the Quincy Institute, this is our ideology and program, uh, a man with considerable instincts in the direction of restraint in US, US foreign and security policy, uh, but uh, who in many ways found himself trapped, ingested by the blob that he inherited. And indeed, um, for example, you know, with reference to the um, intervention in Libya, uh, in his memoirs and in certain interviews, Obama himself, without using the word, has suggested and hinted at something like this. Now, what is a blob? Uh, by the way, uh, this isn't just about America. Every reasonably large country with partly the money to support this kind of intellectual infrastructure has one. And what it means is not just the, the formal institutions of foreign and security policy, uh, the foreign ministry, National Security Council, if there is one, intelligence services, and of course the military, uh, but also the think tanks dealing with foreign and security policy. Uh, and once again, I mean, to the extent that there is one, uh, academia in these spheres very often, and uh, parts of the media. Uh, uh, in Washington, um, it's often ignored outside America, and it's fading in part now as a result of the internet and the decline of the newspapers. But when I was there, it was very evident that uh, in Washington, leading journalists, American journalists, not, uh, <laughs> not British ones, uh, were, were very much political and social lions. In the, on the Washington scene. Um, they were invited to all the best parties and their opinions and views really mattered. I'll come back to the, the US blob, the great blob, the blob of blobs a bit later. Uh, but first, just to talk about blobs in general. Now, every blob, it seems to me, has uh, something that could be described as lying <coughs> somewhere between a standard operating procedure uh, and a doctrine when it comes to the underlying bases of foreign policy. And I, I think, Tom, you said something in that direction the, the other day, uh, which is to say that these are basic assumptions about the fundamental vital interests and goals of the country concerned in the world, and to a lesser extent, depending on the country, about other countries and your relationship to them. And this is, uh, to, to some extent, necessary and inevitable, uh, because um, you, you can't, or you certainly should not have, uh, 
uh, a situation in which the basic direction of a country's foreign policy, foreign security policy, uh, changes with every election or every change of government. Uh, to the extent that one has had this uh, in, in the United States, um, uh, no, most notoriously, of course, with the coming to power of the Trump administration, this has had a pretty disastrous effect uh, on America's um, reputation for reliability. Uh, and above all, of course, and this also goes back to the, the Bush administration of 2000-2004, uh, for America's um, willingness to abide by treaties that it has signed. So, to a degree, you know, this is necessary because it ensures an essential continuity in national policy. Uh, and therefore, of course, ensures alliances, ensures, uh, you know, just the, the whole structure of relations with the outside world. The problem is, of course, uh, when um, you move from standard operating procedure, if you like, to the other end of the, uh, the spectrum, which is enforced dogma or doctrine. And uh, insofar, of course, as blobs are very largely bureaucratic, the tendencies towards this, towards the, the suppression of alternative views or voices is to some extent inherent in the, 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 the nature of the blob and the nature of the, uh, of the doctrines concerned. Now, these doctrines, I'm using the, hard, the hardest form, formulation, it's not always so hard, uh, are, of course, fundamentally derived from the history of the country concerned and from elements of its national culture and attitudes that are deeply rooted in the population or sections of the population. However, they are also worked upon by the particular um, nature, uh, not just of every blob, but of blobs in general. And of course, one inherent characteristic of a foreign and security blob, much more, I would say, than, of a, than when, you know, when it comes to elites and domestic policy, is that they think of themselves as an elite. And they think that they know more than the population in general. And that is partly, of course, because they do. The population in general knows very little about foreign policy or foreign countries and is not very interested. Um, but, uh, of course, <laughs> knowing more is not exactly the same uh, as necessarily being wiser. And uh, the attitudes of the blob are also worked upon uh, by elitism and by its own interests. Uh, and certainly uh, it is rare indeed. There was a, a very brief episode to which Tom alluded in America after the end of the Cold War, uh, in which you will find uh, a blob, or indeed any members of a blob really, uh, calling for a reduction in any overall attitude, strategy or policy, which is going to lead to a significant reduction of employment for the blob. The rice bowl does play, a, as the Chinese say, play a role here. Um, in other words, you know, blobs are by their very nature, um, uh, attracted to the idea of, if not an, uh, an activist foreign policy in terms of actual action, certainly if you look at certain European countries, an activist foreign policy which comes to things that uh, at least the wider penumbra of the blob, foreign uh, present company entirely accepted, of course, is extremely good at, um, which is writing about foreign and security policy. Uh, I, to, um, for my sins, uh, I have had to read in German a good many German documents beginning with, with, with titles like Germany's Responsibility for the Security of Central Asia. No German government, of course, has ever had the slightest intention of taking any responsibility whatsoever for the security of Central Asia. But on the other hand, this has employed a good many bloblings and bloblets to write and earn their salaries for entire careers in many cases. 
Uh, and of course, I mean, to go back to good old Gramsci, um, this is inherently hegemonic. The blob wishes that its views should be uh, accepted by the popula population in general as an aspect simply of common sense, common sense attitudes to reality. Um, and uh, insofar as, <clears throat> you know, once again, uh, in many ways when it comes to foreign policy, uh, the population really is, um, how can I phrase this euphemistically, an illiterate bunch of um, rural <laughs> somethings, uh, you can understand why the blob takes this approach. However, the result clearly can be uh, a set of attitudes leading to policies uh, which may have only a tangential relationship to what an objective observer, uh, but by the way, you, you know what objective observer stands for? Me. me, of course, me, who else, me. An objective observer uh, might see as the real interests of the country or the population or its uh, ordinary citizens. Now, the other thing about these doctrines, I mean, obviously, uh, is that in general, I mean, as a rule, they change only slowly and incrementally over time. It takes some really major shock fundamentally to change uh, a country's foreign and secu security doctrine. Um, that can be, uh, of course, most commonly some crushing defeat as of Germany, Italy, Japan during the Second World War. Uh, it can be, though over a longer period, victory uh, or attack followed by victory as with the United States in the first half of the 20th century. Uh, first involvement, uh, First World War in, well, n not in global affairs because the US had already been there, but in specifically in European affairs, followed by withdrawal. Then, of course, Pearl Harbor, shocking event, followed by uh, within the Western sphere and the Pacific littoral, uh, a, um, a, a complete US victory, which also fundamentally transformed form, um, former uh, US uh, strategic doctrine, attitudes to the world and the institutions concerned. Uh, now, just to go through a few blobs, some blobs, uh, the doctrines of some blobs can be overwhelming overwhelmingly negative, that is to say that they are focused on fear and hatred of one particular country. The Polish blob fundamentally um, is, is simply obsessed with fear and hatred of Russia, um, plus distrust of Germany and everything, the way it sees the world comes out of that. The German blob, of course, is uh, deeply influenced by the Second World War um, and by a desire to anchor Germany in a stable, democratic, free market Europe under the security protection uh, of the USA. There are cases, it seems to me, France at the moment is very much in this position, uh, where different inherited uh, doctrines of the blob, uh, in this case, um, the desire for France to play a, a major role on the world stage, combined with, but on the other hand, uh, the adherence to uh, a, a major and independent role on the world stage, combined with the desire for full membership of Euro-Atlantic structures, pr produces incoherence. You know, you you, you actually cannot derive uh, a consistent foreign security policy from these doctrines. Uh, now, when it comes to how the um, the the blob works, um, I had a. <laughs> a rather amusing, kind of, uh, experience of that at RUSI, the Royal United Services Institute in London, um, in the, the first half of uh, uh, 2008, um, when the British government, um, tagging along as, I think you said, Chai, 10 years after America, um, that decided that if America has a national security strategy, we must have a national security strategy. And uh, Professor Paul Rogers and I were invited to comment on this. And uh, I said, look, um, every conflict, not every conflict, but the great majority of conflicts that Britain has become involved in, uh, in modern history, have been due to Britain's alliances. And that isn't, you know, by any means necessarily an argument against them, 
uh, becoming involved, but you know, it, it has been our commitments to somebody else rather than a direct attack or threat to us. So, well, in these terms, obviously, uh, today, British policy is fundamentally influenced uh, by our membership of NATO and our alliance with the United States. And said, so, you know, we cannot have an, a, an, a, a, any kind of serious national security strategy unless it addresses this issue and whether there are any significant limits to it. And I raised two issues, uh, one of which I'm proud to say I played a, a, a small role in preventing from becoming a disaster, which was the threat of direct intervention or attack on Pakistan um, for its support for the Afghan Taliban. The other, I, I wouldn't say I, I, this showed any great degree of prophecy, except by the standards of um, Washington DC, uh, I warned of the, the danger that Georgia would attack uh, Russia uh, once it thought it had some kind of cover from NATO and the West in an effort to recover its lost territories of South Ossetia and uh, Abkhazia. And I asked, you know, we, we've, got, we've got to think, um, I mean, in the case of Pakistan, because also there's, of course, a huge uh, um, Pakistani community in Britain, so this has the most direct effect on British internal security. So there was this audience about the size of the present one, um, composed of the people in the military rank of colonel, brigadier, junior ambassadors, um, and then various uh, people of indeterminate department. Um, and so I said, so what, 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 do you, what do you think about this? It was wonderful. There was a long, long silence in which they looked at the ceiling. They looked at the floor. They looked out of the window. They didn't look at me. And above all, they did not look at each other. And they said nothing at all. And this went on. And then after, I mean, really, a, a very long pause of 30 seconds or so, the, the, the chairman um, sort of coughed. And, <clears throat> well, well, that was a, a fascinating presentation by, 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 by Dr. Lee. You know, uh, perhaps it's time for coffee. This reminds me of, of a Soviet joke. Uh, but first, I have to ask you a question. Are there any Bulgarians here? <laughs> no Bulgarians? Are there any elephants here? Quite sure? Nobody's concealing a small elephant about their person? Ah, uh, well, it's obvious in terms. Anyway, uh, in that case, I can tell my favorite Bulgarian elephant story uh, from Soviet days. And the story goes that there is a United Nations essay competition on the subject of the elephant. And there has to be one submission from every country, you see. Uh, so, the um, Englishman writes his essay on elephants I have shot. Uh, the Frenchman, of course, writes essay on elephants I have loved. The German writes on elephants I have eaten. The American writes how to make a billion dollars working with elephants. The Soviet writes Russian elephant, biggest elephant in the world. And the Bulgarian writes Bulgarian elephant, best friend of Russian elephant. <laughs> um, now, this, the great thing about this story is that it, it's almost endlessly adaptable. You know, English elephant, best friend of American ele elephant. And now, of course, today, Bulgarian elephant, best friend of American elephant. In fact, everybody's best friend of uh, American elephant. I wouldn't altogether guarantee that there won't be um, a joke like this in 50 years' time, which reads, Bulgarian elephant, best friend of Chinese elephant. But we will see. Uh, so, I mean, in some cases, the, the, the doctrine, uh, even among large countries um, who choose to behave in this way, is simply that one must attach oneself to a more powerful ally and stick with it to the end. Now, coming to the, um, as I say, the blob of blobs, the blobissimo, uh, what uh, are the underlying assumptions of the US blob? Uh, to which everybody who wishes to progress in the blob, they don't have to believe it. Although I would say that, a, I mean, as very much brought out in your talk, Tom, a, a rather specific aspect of the US blob is that actually the great majority of them do believe it. Um, and uh, th this is characterized by a number of things. Um, 
and this is why uh, the Wolfowitz doctrine I mentioned in the title of this talk, because uh, in um, 1992, under the then Bush administration, um, Paul Wolfowitz and Scooter Libby drew up a, a defense planning memo for US strategy over the next decade or so, um, which basically boiled down and said that the United States must maintain a sphere of influence, a kind of version of the Monroe Doctrine, across the entire planet. No other country would have any influence beyond its borders except that allowed to it by the United States, and it was seen by the United States in US, as in US interests. And to a, less, a greater or lesser degree, um, every country would be required to adapt its domestic political system to American wishes. Now, underlying this, of course, is also the conviction uh, that America is doing this not just for itself, uh, though that is not how it's seen, of course, by most of the rest of the world, uh, but for the sake of spreading democracy and freedom and uh, capitalism, free market economics. I mean, in those days, as Tom said, you know, summed up in the Washington Consensus to the whole of the world. And this is, uh, of course, not just good for America, but it's good for humanity. This is in the interests of humanity. And although it's interesting, at the time, um, when this was leaked, it was disowned by the Bush administration. It was also very widely criticized within the United States for um, you know, its, its tremendous ambition. I mean, of course, this bears a relationship to how the Roman Empire, the Chinese Empire uh, saw, well, I suppose saw the, the, the world as they knew it. Though in the case of Rome, it always knew that it had to treat the Persian Empire, for example, as some kind of, if not equal, at least semi-equal. Uh, but even the British Empire at its height, even the Habsburg Empire at its height, never thought that they could control and influence the entire planet in this way. Uh, the British, for example, knew pretty soon that they could not hope to dominate New uh, North America in the face of a growing United States. They had to make accommodations. Um, and uh, of course, the British knew that they couldn't, though they could uh, play balance of power politics on the continent of Europe, they could not possibly dictate to France, Germany, Russia, uh, what their external, let alone their internal policies should be. Uh, so, um, and, but as I say, disowned at the time, but, um, and I think, you know, Tom, you summed this up very well. This did in many ways become the doctrine and standard operating procedure of all succeeding US administrations, both were Democratic, starting with Clinton, and then Republican. It's interesting that, you know, some of the most memorable um, phrasings uh, of this were by Democratic Secretaries of State, notably Madeleine Albright. You know, America is taller, so it sees further. America is the indispensable nation. Hillary Clinton was absolutely about this as well. Uh, well, I think it should be pretty apparent uh, that this underlying attitude to the world was going to crash into the doctrines of other, certain other blobs. I mean, basically, the doctrines of any country which sees itself as a great power, not necessarily a superpower, but certainly a great power within its own area, uh, because, of course, um, this, this doctrine explicitly denies that, contradicts it, rules it out. It's interesting looking at India from this point of view. I think I've said something about this. Um, when I first went out to, to, to India and met official, um, semi-official military families in 1982, India, of course, was a, a tiny fraction of its economy today, far, far poorer, really not considered a significant player in the world at all. But if you met the Indian elites, they were absolutely, absolutely committed to two ideas. One, was that India is a great power. Secondly, that India should be a great power because it had inherited from, you know, from the whole of history, uh, this tradition, this inheritance of great power status, of empire, and of course underpinned 
in a somewhat contradictory way, uh, but by uh, India's international cultural impact. Um, as I say, contradictory, because this embraced Hinduism and Buddhism and Islam. Um, and also contradictory because, as we see now in the, the Modi government, you're inheriting the legacy of the Mughals, uh, while in some cases being bitterly anti-Muslim. And of course, you're inheriting the legacy of the British, because one of the things that really, I think, had a certain influence on these people's mentality was they were all sitting in these grand British imperial buildings in, in New Delhi. Uh, and that India had a right, a right to this, a cultural and moral right to this status. Uh, and that uh, in future, at some point, I mean, in those days it seemed centuries away, but still, India would be a superpower. That once again, all of these things about India, and of course population and size, um, entitled it to this. If you did not believe in all this, you were not going to last long in the Indian blob. Now, in private, some people said, you know, cast, cast doubt on this, but not, um, not in public. And indeed, as we see, see today, now this hasn't led to a major, well, during the Cold War, of course, it did lead to se uh, serious clashes with the United States. And in America, this is seen as a product of, and, and by the way, by many Indians as well, as a product of Nehru's um, uh, post, you know, anti-colonial ideology and also naivety and socialism, you know, that he had this bizarre and, of course, completely mistaken affection for the Soviet Union and that he was transferring his anti-British attitudes to America and so forth. I think that this is, to a considerable extent, wrong. Um, and a, a more accurate view, view was given to me by an Indian ambassador to my once, once asked about alliance with the United States. And he said, look, um, that this was before Modi, but al already after, you know, after the end of the Cold War and so He said, look, we want good relations with, with America. We certainly you know, want trade and uh, American investments. And of course, we want partnership with America against China. Um, we said, we will never enter into a, a, a formal alliance with America for two reasons. The first is, we don't think that, you know, if this leads us into a war with China in the Himalayas, that America will save us. We said the second reason is, America is only capable of understanding alliances in terms of subordination. That in any alliance, America must be, as Biden phrased it when he came back after Trump, not returning to the table, returning to the head of the table. And he said, India is a great power. India will not, is not Denmark, he said. India will not accept a subordinate, you know, a formally subordinate relationship with anybody. Uh, by the way, this guy had, uh, had a daughter at, uh, at university in America, but <laughs> that doesn't really matter. Now, of course, India is, this is all, and, and India has reflected this again and again by refusing to go along with America on various issues, sanctions, of course, number of cases, buying energy from Iran, buying energy from Russia, um, partnership with the United States, but only when it is in India's interest. India will not do anything against what it sees as its important interests, and it will not be dictated to on this subject, nor, by the way, um, uh, will it be dictated to on issues of international morality. Um, you, know, you have all this language, of course, as America and India as democracies, but that does not give America the right to tell India how to, you know, what it is morally right to do in the world. Now, of course, this is modified in the case of India basically by fear of China and a desire for partnership with the United States over that. Uh, and to a lesser extent, of course, now under Modi, uh, a particular hatred of Islam and the Muslim world and therefore cooperation with America and, is and still more Israel in certain respects. But it should be clear that in the case of China and, and Russia, uh, there can be no fundamental accommodation with this American vision. Um, China, obviously. Uh, now, in all blobs, there, there can well be ta tactical differences within the blob about how you respond to a particular issue. Um, there were 
differences, though rapidly suppressed, over the US invasion of Iraq, for example, over Vietnam, over certain issues. Uh, there have been more or less you know, hidden, but nonetheless, uh, we know about them, divisions within the, the Chinese blob about Chinese <coughs> tactics. There have been divisions within the Russian blob. But these are tactical divisions. You will not find, I think, anybody in the Chinese blob, which also um, embraces, of course, think tanks, um, universities, all of, of course, much more formally subordinated uh, to officialdom. You won't find anybody there uh, who does not believe um, that China uh, should play, must play, the role of a superpower on the world stage in terms of equality and full consultation, uh, and that China must play the role of a dominant power in its own region. Uh, and that also China is, uh, although it, the terms of this are highly disputed, a civilization of its own, um, which must not in the last resort accept uh, dominance by any other civilization. Although, of course, in many respects it has, simply as a result of capitalist you know, development. In the case of Russia, uh, there is an absolute consensus um, that Russia is a great power. Um, uh, it, it no longer, um, I, I think, few people under the, well, even in, I mean, actually, even in public, say that Russia is any longer capable of playing the role of a superpower on the world stage. But certainly, Russia is a great power. Uh, on certain issues of what are seen as key Russian interests, like, for example, combating Islamist extremism and terrorism in the Middle East uh, and supporting regimes like uh, Syria, which Russia sees as critical to this, that Russia... No, no, I'm nudging, I'm nudging you. It's right? just, I you. Yeah, it's just, it's just coming to an end. And above all, uh, as in P. Thomas said, that Russia must have not exclusive, I think, anymore, if you look at Russia's relations with Kazakhstan, for example, but predominant influence in the, former Soviet, in the territory of the former Soviet Union. Predominant, not exclusive. Russians, of course, use the, the words Monroe Doctrine so often you'd think that they'd invented it to justify what they're doing. Um, now, uh, this and the, and the contrast with the fundamental attitudes of the US blob uh, did not ensure that this would lead to war. Uh, once again, going back to 1914, contingency matters, assassination of Franz Ferdinand, and agency matters. I think it's, you know, in the end, the decision to invade um, Ukraine was uh, uh, Putin's. You know, his, his decision really, really mattered. Um, but I always said uh, in, well, in, in 2014, uh, that while there were real divisions within the, the, the Russian blob about exactly how Russia should respond, should have responded to the Maidan revolution, and, uh, or whatever you want to call it, um, I always said anyone, uh, as I heard so often in, in the, the, the US blob, who said that a very forceful and harsh Russian reaction to this kind of thing uh, could not have been expected. Um, that should have been considered to write their resignation letter as an expert on Russia. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Han, if you don't mind, I'd love you to go first. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I just have a few scattered, disconnected thoughts to respond to what I just heard. Uh, to kick us off into a discussion on the blob of blobs, that is the US blob in your definition, or blobs in general. And I think, uh, first of all, it's, it's really useful to distinguish, I think, what are two separate questions here. The first question we have to answer is whether there is, in fact, a blob in the United States or in other countries in terms of a mainstream closed off, cabal-like foreign policy establishment? Does it exist? And the second question is, does it determine outcomes? Does the blob determine policy? So you've already sort of outlined uh, the, the definition of the blob, how it has uh, um, become to understand uh, 
uh, since Ben Rhodes used the terms in 2016. Um, there are those in the United States who argue that a blob in fact exists, a sort of club of like-minded elites. Um, Stephen Wald is one of the people who, who would argue that there is a blob in American foreign policy, that if you are a skeptic of American exceptionalism and its ro leading role in the post-World War II world, you're essentially a nobody in the discussion in the United States. But there's also a counter-argument being made. So Hal Brands, Peter Thiever, and William Inboden argued in Foreign Affairs uh, a few years ago in a, uh, an article entitled In Defense of the Blob, that in fact the United States has a very healthy marketplace of foreign policy ideas, that discussion over American foreign policy is loud, contentious, diverse, and generally pragmatic. And as a result, the nation gets to learn from its past mistakes. Dan Dresner has taken a similar line in, in the Washington Post, echoing that sentiment and to provide evidence sort of against the existence of a blob. He's given the rise of the Quincy Institute, um, but also has said that the fact that uh, individuals like um, Andrei Bacevich and Stephen Wald are not marginalized voices at all in the foreign policy discussion. Sorry, we are uh, speaking on behalf of the Quincy Institute. Oh, yes, we are. And as far as these people are concerned, in the immortal words of a, a British prostitute um, accused of having a relationship with a British politician, she was asked, uh, but, but, but Lord Profu, you, you are aware that whatever his name was, uh, has, has denied this. And she replied, well, he would say that, wouldn't he? Fair enough. Um, <laughs> Just, just repeating the argument, the uh, the argument uh, and um, um, the counter argument here for for the sake of of, of kicking up a discussion, but um, to come sort of towards some counter arguments um, against the existence of of a blob. Um, the first thing perhaps to note is that you do have a, what's called the revolving door in the United States. Um, so unlike communities in other countries. The American foreign policy establishment, I think, is more connected to society than it's the case in other countries, uh, that you have outside experts and government officials who go back and forth. And as a German, I would certainly note that that is something I have always looked at with a certain degree of envy, because I myself am in my mid-30s, have chosen the career, first pursuing a PhD and now working in a think tank, and I know for myself that I will almost certainly never have the chance to serve in government because we do not have a revolving door. So if I ever wanted to, to enter the establishment, the, the foreign office or consult policy, I would have it much harder than, uh, than in the United States. Uh, I think another argument to weigh in our discussion is uh, to look at the historical evidence um, and, and, and point to examples where there's really no anonymity among those who shape foreign policy outcomes and that there can be great intellectual heterogeneity among those. You already pointed to the debate around the um, invasion of Iraq in 2003 and the debates perhaps between a Colin Powell and a Dick Cheney, but we see, see, saw it more recently with uh, James Mattis and Trump over Syria policy. I think we see it today in the United States when I think what to do with the Iran nuclear deal or what to do with nuclear arms control with the Russian Federation going forward. These are actually quite contentious issues where within the blob, there is really quite a divergence of views. Uh, another argument to weigh in our discussion, I think, um, and this is more on the question of whether blobs actually chain, uh, shape outcomes, is whether a focus on the blob might obscure the importance of individual leaders and psychological and emotional factors driving individual leaders. I think in the international relations discipline, there's a resurgence in recent years in the importance of what's called the first image or the role of leaders in shaping outcomes. Um, one can point to quite, quite a few examples to discuss that, but I think actually, and this is again something you already addressed, uh, Putin's decision to invade Ukraine last year, um, I think is a, is a perfect example to to weigh the pros and cons of a leader-centric explanation. Because I would agree that many in the, if you want to make the argument that there is a Russian blob, um, many shared the underlying grievances against the West harbored by Putin. But I think as many in this room have already pointed out, probably few of those would have opted to go to war in February of last year. I do, however, think that you could switch this argument around to actually 
say that uh, the decision to invade Ukraine does show the importance of a closed off small group of people, because if it is indeed true that there was an exclusive circle of people who advised Putin, who perhaps fed him erroneous intelligence on the situation in Ukraine and what the Russians would face when inv inv invading Ukraine, then that could be, have been causally relevant for the outcome. So I guess here it depends on how we define a bloc. Do we mean a broader foreign policy establishment to include intellectuals, experts, or do we mean a sort of a smaller community of advisors in, in this instance? Uh, a small note on, uh, on the notion that blobs can change, coming again from Germany, I think looking at, what, at what's happening with Seitenwende since last February, uh, the idea that we need to fundamentally rethink our place in the world and how we conduct foreign policy uh, to abandon our post sort of World War II uh, look at the world, I think is, is proving really contentious in Germany right now. There's real contestation happening. I don't even think there's a new consensus shaping up, a new blob. I think this will be a contentious issue uh, for quite some time to come. Uh, and the very final reflection I, I did want to make on your notion of the suppression of alternative voices that you say happen in blobs. I do think that suppression of alternative voices is a problem. And I've wondered myself over the last year whether war heightened the tendency towards groupthink. Um, Jacob Halbron, he argued in Politico in May of last year that the war against Ukraine was reviving the bloc in the United States, given a revived enthusiasm about NATO, the importance of the Western alliance, and that has put the realists and the restrainers on the back foot. Um, I would, you know, I would personally say that I have felt as someone, you know, working in the space, commenting, commenting to media, writing, being engaged in social media, that there has been a tendency to suppress alternative uh, voices. And I've wondered myself whether that is perhaps an inevitable byproduct of the times we live in, meaning that war, which produces heightened emotion, automatically has this tendency to suppress uh, alternative views whether it is to some extent a product of social media, of Twitter, of that kind of space in which debate happens, and whether perhaps wars magnify the sense, uh, a need for a sense of belonging, because it is in uh, perhaps, especially during times of conflict and war, perhaps psychologically difficult to find yourself in a minority, to advocate for more nuanced, more perhaps carefully considered or shades of gray views, in times of war, because they, those can often be the automatically unpopular views, because you're accused of being a quote unquote useful idiot for the other side, you're being accused of advertently or inadvertently supporting the narrative of the adversary. Uh, those are just a, a few uh, reflections to throw out there. Thank you so much, Hannah. <clears throat> Tom. What can I say after two great presentations, and I've already spoken uh, too much. <clears throat> Um, just a, uh, a couple of points uh, that might add something um, uh, to the uh, discussion. Uh, first point uh, is that you know, any great power has to have some mission in the world, and there has to be some sort of understanding of what the fundamental um, values are uh, that undergird a uh, a country's uh, a country's foreign policy, uh, you know, some of that gets distilled in something like the Wolfowitz uh, doctrine. Uh, but almost everybody who engages uh, in uh, in the United States on foreign policy and in the debate over uh, sort of um, specific issues does share some uh, common view about um, the leading role that the United States plays. Uh, in, in global affairs, and there may be um, some differences of, uh, of opinion as to whether it is the leader, the only leader, uh, but it's hard to, to engage in foreign policy and not take into account the tremendous power that the United States has um, uh, and a responsibility to use that um, in a responsible fashion uh, on, the, uh, on the global stage. Um, I think you also uh, have to fundamentally agree that uh, what drives the United States uh, is a desire not only to protect its, uh, its own national interest, uh, but to advance 
a set of values uh, that uh, do improve the, uh, the, the, the well-being and the welfare uh, of other countries uh, around the world. Um, uh, the, uh, you know, even if we make mistakes from time, to time, from time to time, yet there still is a fundamental goodness about the United States and the way we approach the world affairs um, that has to be an essential element of, in the thinking of anyone uh, who wants to engage in, uh, in Russian, or excuse me, uh, in the making of American foreign policy. You wouldn't get into government um, if you didn't uh, have that, um, uh, that, fundamental, uh, that fundamental belief. Um, you know, whether uh, we have something like a blob that's all embracing that excludes uh, all competing uh, points of view, I think I come down um, more on the side of, of Hannah on this is that uh, there is a, uh, a lively debate in the United States uh, over foreign policy. Uh, even if there is a tendency in certain elements to try to suppress alternative points of view, the fact is that eternal alternative points of view are being expressed. Uh, specifically, it comes uh, to the question of Ukraine. Um, uh, there's a lively debate in the United States right now uh, as to whether we should push for negotiations and under what circumstances uh, of the role that the United States uh, should play uh, in any negotiation of um, how much uh, or what the, uh, how far the United States should go in support of Ukraine, what the limits of our support are. Uh, and that all gets factored into the um, uh, into the policy making process uh, in the administration. Uh, I think it's also important to remember, particularly when it comes to something like Ukraine, is that what the administration says publicly uh, is not entirely reflective of what it's thinking uh, behind closed doors. Um, uh, there are statements that you have to make in public in order to maintain a, uh, a certain position, to maintain unity, uh, to prevent the, the outbreak of debilitating uh, debates uh, among allies or with the Ukrainians. Uh, but that's not necessarily uh, what you're saying privately uh, among yourselves or to your, uh, or to your allies uh, in preparation for the various scenarios that might take, uh, not, might take place going forward. Um, so that's one point. Um, the second on the revolving door um, you know, I think the, the problem with the revolving door uh, in, uh, in the United States now, it's a, it's a revolving door that takes place largely uh, with inside the Beltway in Washington. In the globe. In, well, absolutely. Uh, is that, I mean, if you look at um, earlier uh, periods in American history, uh, you know, the revolving door would bring in people well outside of, uh, of Washington. Um, to participate in government, um, the idea that um, uh, government was uh, was an element of public service, it was an honorable thing to do, uh, when people came with the idea that they would spend uh, a few years making policy and then return to the private sector to continue what they're doing, uh, and maybe again in the future returning to government. Uh, what we've seen grown up, uh, grow up in the United States uh, since the end of the Cold War uh, is a think tank community that's largely based in Washington. And what are people in the think tank community uh, there for? They're there um, to replace the, um, the, the outgoing government um, when you know, their candidate wins elections. So it's the government in exile in many ways. Um, it's the people who uh, are always measuring for the curtains in the office that they hope to occupy uh, after the next uh, election that I think suppresses um, the range of views that are expressed inside of Washington. Um, but there's a lively debate going on outside Washington. One of the advantages of living outside Washington um, is that you realize that there's a multitude of different attitudes uh, that do filter in um, at the highest levels of government, but Washington is largely unaware of them. Uh, because there is a discipline inside Washington um, that helps prepare you 
for the next administration, I guess is a, a way I would put it. Um, if you're uh, of democratic leanings, you don't want to say anything that's too far out of the, the mainstream, which may exclude you from participating in a campaign and therefore getting your job in office. Same thing is true of, uh, of Republicans, although well, that's become a bit more difficult since Trump arrived. Um, and it's hard to know what a mainstream Republican view is on foreign policy anymore uh, and how you measure the curtains for the, in the office you want to occupy. Um, the, the final uh, point I would make uh, is that the debate opens up in the United States uh, when you reach inflection points, historical inflection points. Um, uh, so clearly, after the um, uh, Second World War, a lively debate about how the United States uh, should pursue uh, its interest in a world, how engaged the United States should be in the world. Um, uh, and that was new because the United States hadn't been engaged um, uh, centrally in global affairs until the, until the Second World War. We didn't get that uh, in 1989 because uh, or 1991, because that really wasn't much of an inflection point. The world really didn't change that much. The only thing that changed is that the, uh, that the other superpower uh, was eliminated from the stage. Um, the impact that that had uh, on, uh, on the United States that you see in something like the, the Wolverine Doctrine is the, uh, the loss of the appreciation of the limitations on, uh, on American power uh, that had um, informed our decision throughout the Cold War. Um, so we continued the policy that we wanted to continue in the Cold War, absent the countervailing uh, force in world affairs. Uh, you know, I think we are reaching an inflection point now, uh, once again in history. Um, this is not 1989, this is much more like 19. Uh, nine, you know, the late 1940s, um, in historical terms, is much more like the late 19th and early 20th century, given the geopolitical technological changes uh, that are taking place that impact not only on the balance, the global balance of power, um, uh, our technological capabilities, uh, but the very fundamental uh, attitudes we have towards uh, what it means to be a human being. Uh, you think about artificial intelligence, bioengineering, uh, for example. Uh, and there is a much more open debate in the United States now uh, about how the United States is going to move forward, how it positions itself in global affairs. Um, I mean, clearly, you have a Biden administration um, that is hearkening back uh, to the, um, uh, the post-Cold War um, or the post post-war, Second World War tradition of American foreign policy. Uh, but the role that Trump played, uh, I think the positive role that he played in American foreign policy was asking the questions uh, that hadn't been asked uh, for many, many years. He had none of the answers, had no intention of answering the questions. Um, but they have put out in public a series of questions about um, uh, how the United States goes about managing its alliances, what its responsibilities to its allies are, um, what its, uh, how it relates to other major powers in the world uh, that is healthy. Uh, and is it a debate that will continue um, through this electoral cycle uh, into, the, um, into the electoral cycle of 2028, um, where we'll come out uh, at the end of this? Um, I think we'll be in a different place uh, where we have been over the past several decades. Uh, but it's going to be influenced not only by what happens domestically in the United States, but obviously what happens uh, abroad. And then uh, perhaps one final point here. Um, uh, interesting, you know, how the United States thinks about great powers. Right? Um, can you be a great power in the American view uh, without being a competitor. Um, we talk about great power competition now. Well, who's the competition among? Um, China, Russia. We don't see India as a great power because we don't see it as a competitor. Um, <laughs> yes. Right? We don't see any European countries as great powers 
because we don't see them as a competitor. Um, you know, the one thing we're concerned about uh, with Europe is that is what Macron talks about all the time is European strategic power, a strategic autonomy. The Europeans finally becoming a great power, um, as Dominique continental in size, right? Uh, large population, technologically advanced, um, that actually could challenge the United States uh, if it wanted to. We have no interest in that. Um, uh, but again, the fundamental point uh, is that we only see great powers if they in some way are opposed to what the United States does on, on, the, global, uh, on the global stage. So we really don't want a multipolar world. What we feel comfortable with is a multilateral environment in which the United States or at least this administration would argue where the United States plays the leading role in deciding where uh, that multilateral, multilateral um, uh, group uh, uh, moves and what its fundamental uh, uh, goals are. Let me end there. Thank you. Shall I respond briefly? I think so, yeah. Mm -hmm. But briefly. Briefly, like briefly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. Um, uh, Tom, I, I agree with everything you, you, you just said with one uh, one small uh, difference. And I, I would say, I mean, this revolving door, I mean, from, I used to dream of that as a, you know, as a, as a aspirant blobling. I came to see it as profoundly corrupting. Um, you know, because when I, when I was in mainstream US think tanks, uh, you, you know, you, you could see how so many of my colleagues were tailoring everything that they said and wrote, even when in private they were saying very, very different things, precisely to their desire, you know, to be the next assistant deputy, whatever it was. And, well, yeah, you said within the beltway, I would say within the blob. You're quite right, of course. Outside, yes. Um, you know, America is not a, thank God, a dictatorship or autocracy. There are other views, but it's a question of what views are genuinely accepted within uh, the blob. And from that point of view, I would say, I mean, if you go back in history, and this is not just hindsight, because, you, you know, r real experts, people on the ground, people who had studied the history of regions knew it very well. Uh, there were things which should have been blindingly obvious at the time, and were obvious, as I say, to real experts, uh, which were excluded from the blob by the, the, the blob with disastrous results. And one of them, of course, uh, the role of Vietnamese nationalism in the communist movement in Vietnam and national reunification as opposed to communist revolution as a fundamental appeal. And I had a, a, a rather amusing conversation with a CIA man, ex-CIA man, o over that, um, who reacted furiously to my suggestion um, that, uh, you know, uh, uh, the CIA had failed, you know, adequately to study the realities of, you know, I quoted Ellsberg's famous thing about, you know, no middle ranking official having been able to pass a freshman exam in Vietnamese history or culture or whatever. And he replied, that's absolute nonsense, absolute nonsense. I can assure you that by 1969, we had a totally accurate view of the relationship between Vietnamese communism and Vietnamese nationalism. You, you, get, you all get the joke? Uh, America sent its army to Vietnam in 1965. <laughs> um, 1969, sure. Uh, at the same time, and this, this emerges actually very much from the now published documents, the growing split between the Soviet Union and China in the early 1960s, which fully recognized and properly seen would have made the whole d domino effect idea ridiculous and therefore would have made intervention in Vietnam unnecessary because you simply then play as Kissinger and Nixon later did the great communist powers against each other and you can actually track how junior CIA people were reporting that and how it was gradually filtered out as it made its way up the system until you know very determined statements of fact about the the, the growing breach were rendered down into possibilities, conditionalities, theories, and so forth. And finally, I would say um, policy towards, to, towards Russia. Um, you know, the, the, the where people, I mean, well, Kozarev from Russia, Kennan, I mean, so many, uh, three in the end, former US ambassadors, including the present head of the CIA, were warning and warning and warning about the consequences of this.
of, of you know, NATO expansion, an attempt basically to, to eliminate Russian influence within the, the former Soviet Union. And the blob did, in the end, you know, exclude them. And as a participant, I mean, it's all very well to say that there was a debate about the uh, invasion of uh, Iraq. Um, it, well, I mean, two things. One is obviously it didn't work in terms of preventing the invasion of Iraq. Um, so many, I mean, so many of the views of, of real experts about Middle Eastern society were filtered out, not just by, you know, officialdom, but by the, the papers. Um, and um, strikingly, uh, the system did not learn, in fact, from previous mistakes, because um, what we, we later found was, you know, in terms of the problems you were going to face in Iraq, it wasn't just looking at the nature of Iraq, it was looking at the nature of America, or you could say counterinsurgency, various things, all of which should have been apparent from, um, you know, from the Vietnam War. So, um, no, I mean, I stick to my, my point. Um, yes, there is a blob. Uh, it can change. But look, when it comes to Germany, um, the fundamentals haven't changed. Uh, Germany is dependent on the United States in security terms. Uh, we will see how much it does, you know, in terms of its, you know, its own security, uh, in terms of really paying. There is no, uh, G Germany is deeply opposed to um, any kind of really, uh, you know, autonomous um, role for, for Europe uh, in security. And I have to say, uh, the German think tanks are increasingly, I mean, an extension of, um, of the American blob, and no. I mean, it's not merely that you don't have the advocacy now of a, of a seriously different policy towards Ukraine. Um, you don't have an honest uh, examination, I mean, a really honest a debate on post-German policy. It's simply, um, you, you know, beating the breast over Germany's, you know, alleged mistakes. Um, and, fine, no, no, and just one more. And there was no serious investigation in Germany by the media, by the media, let alone, you know, think tanks and so forth, of the allegations over the North Stream pipeline. <laughs> Yeah. I, I we have two two finger interventions. First by Hannah, is that all right? Yeah, that's fine. And then by Tom. She's and a lot, she's a lot smarter than I am. And we'll do uh, Michael's uh, innovation, which is those standing up signs and going around the room. Okay, Hannah, and then Tom. I mean, it's just a very brief comment uh, about um, uh, the way in which blobs or predominant discourses can change, and I think it's it's important to to ask always the question, what, what timeline do we have to apply? I mean, Zeitenwende is now, what, 16 months old? Um, to break through a consensus about post-World War II German foreign policy that lasted for eight decades. So I think if you look at what has actually already happened, the fact that Germany is supplying leopard tanks to Ukraine, I think if you had put that to someone two or three years ago, it would have been absolutely unthinkable. So yes, not everything has changed. I mean, I think these things take, take time to change. But, but there is real change. And, and also about your point about uh, American foreign policy not having learned um, about its past mistakes in the Middle East. Again, I very much agree um, learning after the invasion of Iraq was absolutely not immediate. It took a very long time. But I would say today American foreign policy has arrived at a point where it realizes that democracy promotion and nation building in the Middle East is a, is a flawed approach. So it has taken a long time. I agree with that. But there can be learning and change. Come. Just very briefly, the way change comes in the United States is largely through presidential elections, um, where a, a president in the campaign uh, will bring together people, uh, many of them not drawn from inside the beltway, from across the country. Uh, yes, if you take your example of um, the Sino-Soviet split, if we had recognized that in 19... Uh, 61 or 62, we may have had a different policy. Uh, but that policy changes in an election in 1968, in part because of uh, the people around Nixon and Nixon himself uh, recognized uh, the importance of China, the differences, and brought that group inside, uh, inside the decision-making process. Um, you know, the same thing occurs between, with the, you know, that Trump's another good example of that. Uh, whether it's positive or negative, we can uh, we uh, we can debate, but brings in a different set of individuals 
who then want to put the United States on a different course. And we'll see what happens in 2024 um, <clears throat> of who actually uh, become the foreign policy advisor of whoever the Republican candidate uh, is. And that will have an impact uh, on the policy debate. The Republican candidate wins. It will mark a some some shift in the way Washington pursues its foreign policy. So we have a a way of over time, uh, as building was Hanna is saying, of correcting uh, some of the mistakes that um, the previous administrations uh, have made. Maybe not in a dramatic fashion, but more in the sense of a uh, an ebb and flow uh, in uh, in the way we pursue certain goals in the world. Thank you. So. Um I'm just going to mention this. What I learned from this panel is there's probably something like a blob, uh, but there's also serious debate, both within and without. Uh, and, but they do have different weights. So the people who are much more influential than others. In other words, I always tell my students, I take a radical middle position. <laughs> <laughs> it's middle, but it has to be radical. What, but then I ask the question, which we may talk about later, is what if both the blob and those not in the blob fundamentally hold similar views. That is not even understanding that they're living within a hegemonic discourse mm. in which common yeah. sense is common and not much questioning going on. Anyway, that's, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah that's, that's something cool. I would So I'm going to go, if you don't mind, I'll start on the left for obvious reasons. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Radical. Radical. 